So I put together one video that a lot of people found really, really helpful. And in that video I talked about conventional filtration. Conventional filtration is something that's been around for quite a long time. And a lot of plants use conventional filtration. Conventional filtration goes coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, and filtration. The filters in conventional filtration generally use your gravity, sand filters at the very end. Well, technology is changing and a lot of the more current, newer plants are going towards membrane filtration. A lot of people found that video really, really helpful because a lot, most plants that still exist are conventional filtration. A lot of the testing problems, in fact, most of all the testing problems you'll see if you're testing for certification are based on conventional filtration plants. However, I think it's really good to also get a grasp of what a membrane plant might look like um, because there are a ton of membrane plants going up in the industry. It's kind of the wave of the future. And also when you go from plant to plant to plant, it's kind of funny. You could work on a plant your whole career and think you know everything about that plant and then go and actually take a tour of another plant and the things and the processes that they use are completely different. And then you can go to another plant and the processes that they use are completely different. So by viewing a few different types of plants, it really gives you a much more of a well-rounded base as to the type of things that happen in the industry. So that's what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna give you kind of another quick walkthrough tour of an ultrafiltration membrane plant. This particular plant uses ultrafiltration membranes. Like I just said, it has a maximum capacity of 40 million gallons and the membranes that it uses are submersible. If you're interested in seeing, hearing a lot more about membrane filtration specifically, go check out the podcast, um, waterseafu.com, W-A-T-E-R-S-I-F-U.com. I think it's number like 27, maybe. I did a whole podcast on membrane filtration and that'll explain a lot of it in detail. More detail than I'm gonna get into in this video here right now where I'm showing you the whole plant processes. There are four common types of filtration used in the system right now. We have microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis. The farther you go down that list, the greater removal efficiency of particles. So the smaller the holes in the fibers, the more you can remove. The smaller the particles you can remove, I should say. However, the farther you go down that list, also the greater the power needs. The first two things on that list, microfiltration and ultrafiltration, can be in pressure vessels or in submersible systems like we see here. What we're looking at today is ultrafiltration using submersible membranes. And we'll get into exactly what that is down the road. As you get into nanofiltration and as you get into reverse osmosis, you're gonna be using uh, enclosed pressure vessels and the power costs are gonna be way through the roof because you need much higher pressure pushing the water through those fibers. So what I wanna to do today is to start at the beginning of this plant and walk you through comparing this process with the last process of the conventional filtration plant that we looked at in the other video. Let's, we'll get here to these fibers a little bit down the road, but let's start at the very beginning of the plant right now. So here we are at the very beginning of the plant and we're gonna go through this process. Before I hop right into it though, I wanna answer the question, why, why membrane filtration? What makes membrane filtration any better than conventional filtration? Why is, um, why are plants shifting towards membrane filtration? Well, there's a number of reasons. For one, although this is a very, very large plant, you have the capacity with membrane filtration to filter the same amount of water in a much smaller place. So you can filter, for example, 25 million gallons of water at a membrane plant at easily a quarter the size of a conventional plant filtration plant. Also, membrane plants, I talked about the four different types of membranes. Well, even at the lowest level, for example, of microfiltration, the removal efficiency of microfiltration is much greater than the removal efficiency 
of conventional filtration using sand filters, gravity sand filters. And state regulations are getting stricter and stricter all the time, which is actually forcing plants away from more of the conventional type thing towards membrane filtration. So for the removal efficiency, for the greater um, use of space, those are some of the most common reasons that people are switching towards membrane filtration. Remember if you looked at the last video on direct filtration, we had coagulation where everything happened in a flash mix and we add coagulant chemicals to the water. So we do the same thing at this plant, but we don't have a flash mix per se at this plant. And when we talk about the addition of chemicals, I don't want to repeat too much that I've already said in the last video, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say it again briefly. Um, water in its natural state has no charge. Most of the harmful particles that are all going to be in the water have a slight negative charge to them. So what we do is we add coagulants to the water, which are generally metallic metals that have a positive charge to them. And then we have a rapid mixing motion where the water gets mixed up and these positively charged coagulants get mixed rapidly throughout the water. So they can all bang together and catch those negatively charged um, harmful particles in the water and they kind of stick together to each other. That's the process that they call coagulation and most places that happens in a flash mixer between 30 seconds to a minute maximum. In the last treatment plant you saw that happen in a flash mixer. This is a little bit different and here you see the injection of the chemicals. This plant used to inject ferric iron now they just switched to something called aluminum chlorohydrate and they're getting a better uh, cost out of aluminum chlorohydrate because they can get the same results using much less chemical which passes on the cost of savings down to everybody on down the road. So no flash mixer here. No flash mixer but as you can see they're injecting the chemicals right into the line as it comes in and what they use is the mixing process. There used to be a mixer here, you see that right there, but they found that it wasn't as effective and they were having problems with it breaking. So they actually use the hydraulics of the pipe. This water comes in, hits the end of a pipe at a T right there and tees off two different directions and then 90s again and goes through this valve which they use, keep slightly throttled to basically cause that stuff to mix together right through that little area right there pretty roughly and they've found it at this plant to be very effective. Now you're seeing what is kind of similar to what we saw at the last plant here. Remember at the beginning of the last plant, the conventional plant video, there was basically four different areas. There's two different sides and each side had two different areas within it so that in peak demand you can have all four sides running but as the flow didn't need to be so great you could turn one side off you can use it offline for cleaning and so forth and you could only use the other side as well. Same thing is with this plant, so we have the replication, we have the water come in and the water splits towards two inward pipes. There's one pipe right there and there's the other pipe right there. So you could have both these pipes running as far as the water coming out on both sides of capacity or you can only have one running. In this case, this plant today only has one side running which is awesome because I'll be able to show you the side that's running and compare it against the side that's not running. And then each of these two sides further split into two more sides. So very, very similar to the last plant where we came in, we had the flash mix and then we had those flocculation basins that there were four different basins. This plant has four different basins that the plant can go through as well. And we're gonna hop up to that part next. Just like the other one, we have our mixing here and then we're gonna go into the flocculation which is more of a gentle mixing area. We'll show you that in just a second here. So the water comes in at this plant through either one or both of what they refer to as a train here, train one and train two. Right now this plant only has one of the trains running, the other one is offline. Off and you have the mixing of the chemical down there like we just showed and then the water hits this 190 and then goes through another 90 right here and then it goes into either of these units that are running. This plant at this time has two units offline. That initial area works kind of like hydraulically, kind of like the flash mix in my direct filtration video or my conventional filtration video. Very similar to that last plant, then what this plant does is it goes through a period or a series of baffles 
where we have a gentler mixing, where those flock particles that are coming together, those positive and negative particles, uh, the positively charged coagulant, the negatively charged ion, where we want to have a gentle mixing so those, those particles can come together and form kind of a heavier, perfect sized flock. Different plants will do different things, like the last plant. They accomplish that here through a series of baffles. At the last plant, if you remember, there were walls that had holes and it would pass it through a hole high on one wall and a hole low on the other wall. Well, this one has walls that it sends it over and under and then through a series of baffles in the process. The water comes in from those trains and there's a compartment here. It comes in through several holes on the back wall, which are a little too dark to see at this point, but they're square holes in the wall. And the water will come up over this wall here and then it goes down through all these baffles. These baffles were intended to direct the water to kind of mix it um, without actually having a mixing arm that would have power costs and consumptions and things that could break. So it directs it all different ways. You can see those baffles don't all point in the same direction as it goes down through layers and layers of layers. I think there's four layers of baffles here. And then there's another wall here. So we go over that first wall, under the second wall, then on the other side, it goes up again through these baffles, over this wall, and then down again and under this other wall. So this other wall, it goes under that other wall and it comes up into the next section of what this plant refers to as pre-treatment, basically trying to get the water exactly where you want, as pure as you want, before even sending it to the fibers, which is pretty awesome. I've seen treatment plants and the treatment plant we used to work at before, we could take the water straight out of the creek and send it straight to the fibers without doing any of this. That was a 5 million gallon plant, this is a 40 million gallon plant. Um, but they also, they have, you know, several other things in place to prepare the water prior to just directly hitting the fibers. So like I said, number of different ways that you can treat the water. Let me show you how this looks for something that's online. I'll turn around behind me and show you this. So you see the water, it's coming over that initial compartment that I showed you, and it's cascading over that water. So you have a mixing there, then it's gonna go down underneath that wall, it's going through baffles here. On the other side, it comes up through that wall, and you can see the water's not just ripping through there, it's a very, very gentle mixing. And as that water gently mixes, it forms flock particles, which you might be able to see in the water down there. So these flock particles are basically just a combination of the coagulant with the harmful particles in the water that we want to remove. Then it goes down under this next wall and this comes into a, uh, a next area that they call the ZAF, a DAF, a dissolved air flotation. And this is unique and this is another current technology. What a lot of places do is they have a sedimentation type basin and what they'll do is the water moves slowly through that basin and those flock particles settle out to the bottom and then they skim the water off the top. Something a little different that this plant does is they float, instead of letting that stuff settle to the bottom, they float it to the top and then they skim it off of the top of the water. So here's where the DAF, the DAF, the DAF unit, the dissolved air flotation unit, here's kind of what it looks like when nothing's in it. That water came under that last wall and it comes up on the other side. You can see there's a number of injectors down there. And this pressure vessel right here is a combination of air and water and it ejects air into the water. As those particles that were forming of the flock and the other thing come up, they get air injected which floats everything to the very top. The rest of the water comes over this wall and skims through and uh, excuse me, and goes through into the other side and goes through those holes in the bottom of that floor down there. That's actually a false floor. So that water comes through that false floor, comes up on the other side here, and then goes over this wall. There's a little wall that you'll see down in there. And it goes over that wall to the next section of pretreatment. Let's show you what that looks like again for the side that's online. So the Water is coming up through. You see these posts, that's where those injectors are. You see the white on the surface of the water. What that white is, is actually just the air. A lot of times, like if you go to your tap and your water looks really white, that's just entrained air. If you put your hand over the top of the glass and give it a shake, you'll see it all clear right out. And what we have on top is this blanket of sludge, which is all the stuff that's been removed from the water. 
Let's go ahead and show you how they clean that sludge blanket off. So everything that we've talked about through this pre-treatment process has all been done without any power. It's all done hydraulically, just from the water flowing from one basin to another. And since this water just flows over and under and over and under the wall, all these basins kind of float at the exact same level throughout them all. So the water goes under this false floor, comes up over the other side, and on this side where it's running, you can actually see that water skimming over and then it gets carried on to the next processes. By lifting a weir on this side where the water skims over, so by raising a false wall that comes up a little higher, the water will stop skimming over the surface until the water level builds up higher. By building the water level up higher there, it builds the water up higher in tune all the way across this pretreatment process because remember all this floats together. By raising the water level all the way across that, it increases the water level in this DAP area and it increases that sludge blanket to a level that's higher than that little wall right there and in tune skims off the top of that sludge and it goes into a little compartment here where it gets carried off the waste. Let's see what that process looks like. So this wall comes up over here. It forces the water level to float higher all the way across the unit. You can see that the water level in this basin begins to rise. At the same time along the wall, they have what's called sludge cutters that basically spray the wall to make sure everything gets broken loose all around the side of this and that everything is clean. It basically breaks it loose and cleans it all off and pushes it forward. You can see the water level over here is starting to get higher to the top of that weir and at the same time, the water in the DAF unit is getting higher, the sludge is getting near the top and it's gonna overflow this trough very quickly here. You see this parts of the sludge beginning to go over the top. This is completely awesome because as opposed to settling the stuff to the bottom and then having to take the whole thing offline and dig it out, you're able to skim the stuff right off the top and get much longer runs out of your pre-filtration process. You see right now that sludge is skimming right off the top and it's being carried away to waste. So just to recap real quick with this plant, we've had the addition of the coagulant, the hydraulics of the turning of the pipes served kind of like the flash mixer, kind of like the coagulation process. Then we went through that period of baffles with the gentle mixing that served as kind of like the flocculation process. Then as part of the pre-treatment for the pre-treatment in this plant, they had those DAF units, dissolved air flotation, where they skim the particles off the top. Worked kind of like a sedimentation type thing. Now what happens in this plant is they have to take care of their source water to treat it properly in terms of alkalinity and pH. So that's what happens in this next step of the treatment at this plant. They have an alkalinity and a pH adjustment. Remember, you want to have your water at an ideal pH. A lot of plants shoot for like 8, 8.1. If your pH is too low, then your water can be too acidic. If your water is too acidic, it can leach the harmful metals out of the pipes, such as lead and copper. You can get that into the system and into the drinking water and people drink that stuff and it can be harmful. So you do not want acidic water in, in uh, what am I doing with this camera here? <laughs> I'm just rambling on and walking. You don't want acidic water in your system. On the flip side of that, you don't want your water to be too basic because if the water is too basic, it can be scale forming and it can cause a whole lot of other problems with, that we can have when water gets scale forming or too hard in the water, too high of a hardness. So we're going to adjust the pH. In addition to adjusting the pH of the water, they want to adjust the alkalinity of the water. Now remember, the pH of the water is basically the level of hydrogen ions in that water okay so it's a it's a level of the acidic or the basic nature of the water the alkalinity of the water are the the particles or the elements or the compounds in the water that give that water a resistance to a change in ph so if a water had very very low alkalinity and then you, you say added some acid to it uh you would see the out the 
pH of the water dropped very, very rapidly. If a water was high in alkalinity and you added acid to that water, for example, then the alkalinity in that water would consume or tie up that acid so that it would not drop the pH of that out the water very quickly. So alkalinity tends to stabilize your pH. pH itself is the acidic or basic nature of the water. The water that comes into this plant is low in alkalinity and it also has a little bit lower than ideal pH. Another issue that this plant used to have that it doesn't have anymore is when they're using ferric iron as a coagulant, ferric tends to drop the pH and consume some of the alkalinity in the water. Uh, since they switched to aluminum chlorohydrate, they don't have that problem so much anymore, but they still do need to idealize or ideally um, level out the pH and alkalinity levels in the water. So the way they do that is by the addition of lime. What this is here is just a huge lime silo. The top of that is just the raw lime and then they drop that quick line into a slaker tank where they mix it up into a slurry right around where those doors are upstairs and then what happens from there is it drops down into a slurry tank. I don't, for the addition of time on this video, I'm not going to get into all that. I'm trying to show you the whole treatment plant and keep it you know under an hour or under a half hour ideally. So then that slurry gets sent out into the basins. After the water came over those last weirs, it goes through this basin and the slurry of the lime is added to the water and that adds alkalinity to the water. That also raises the pH up. Now remember, we don't want the pH to be too high because then there's a whole new set of problems. So we want to add the alkalinity, but we don't want the pH too high. So by the addition of carbon dioxide, they have carbon dioxide over here, they inject that in with water to create carbonic acid. They're going to inject that into this water in the same spot here as well to bring the pH down to an ideal level of 8.1. So we add the lime, jack the pH up, add the alkalinity, add the carbon dioxide, bring the pH back down to an acceptable level. Now you still have that alkalinity in the water. And then the water flows through what they call a stabilization basin after it leaves this, this, uh, this uh, injection area. And it allows the water to kind of stabilize out to allow that mixtures and everything to take place. It goes in through this one area. And now you can see these holes that are in the wall. This is the same type holes that were in the front of the plant when the water first flowed in. So it flows in here through those holes in the walls and then it adds a little bit of contact time by making it flow around this wall out the other side and through that screen and when it goes through the screen then we're going to hit the membrane fibers so there's the side that's offline we're actually fortunate to see half this plan running because you can see what it looks like offline and online this looks like a nice pretty little swimming pool there so the water is flowing through the wall around into the other basin and and next is the membrane building. When you first take a look at this membrane building, it can be a little intimidating. You see all kinds of pumps and all, si all kinds of pipes and everything flowing different ways and turbidimeters and all kinds of valves all over the place. But really, it's not too difficult. Very similar to the last video which we did. Remember in the last video that we did on conventional filtration, there was eight separate filter cells. So you could have those filters either be on or off based on flow. Very, very similar in the membrane building here. There's eight different filter cells and each one of them is an exact duplication from the other. There's basically kind of two stories to this building. The water actually comes into the bottom and fills up eight separate containment areas. Let's walk over here for a second. So it actually fills up eight separate containment areas, which are basically like basins, okay? And within each of those basins sets a series of what they here call cassettes. A cassette is a, is a series of fibers, and this fiber just sits right inside of that basin. And each one of these are the same thing. So that's one basin over there. This is another basin over here and so on down. So let's focus on this one right now. The water flows into the bottom. Let's show you that real quick and then we'll come back here. So here's the bottom of where we just were. 
Remember when we showed that basin outside, we showed the water flowing through the screen, that pipe stays underground and then splits. And the water comes up from here and flows into the backside of this basin and actually fills this basin. If you look down this way, you'll see the same thing all the way down. Eight different pipes coming up, filling up eight different basins. You'll see this piping up above, and that's for intense cleaning of the fibers that they do every once in a while. That's not going to be part of the, the process that we're going to explain today, because right now I'm kind of just trying to walk you through the actual treatment process. So the water is going to come in through here, and it fills a basin, and that basin is full of these units, these fiber units, that will filter the water out. Let's go back upstairs. So this is a picture of one, what they call a cassette here. There are six of these cassettes that sit in each of these vats of water, okay? And each of these cassettes are full of a number of what they call modules. You see all these different individual modules. There's three rows on the bottom, the middle, and the top. Each of those rows of modules create what's called a stack of modules. The water sits through there and it gets pulled through. The submersible, those pumps that you saw on the other side, create a suction which pulls the water through. The water comes out through these, these permeate ports and they meet on top into a main port. They all tie into that. The water comes down through this main port and each of where these connect to come out of a port for each stack. It comes out of each of these and it ties into a main header. The main header goes down to the end. This is the main, the main header comes down to the end here and it ends up going down. The pump right there is what pulls it out and it ties into a large permeate header. And each of these trains tie into that permeate header where all the water is collected as an aggregate and sent out of the filter portion of the plant. It's really kind of rough doing this video because I could easily spend an hour, an hour and a half explaining stuff and I just want to show you basically the gist of how the plant works to give you an overall feel for it. Here's that cassette back into the ground. You can see each of those individual stacks have a ball valve of itself on top so that you can isolate that. Like I said, I could spend a lot of time talking about the processes, but I don't really have time for that. There are two things that I want to explain to you quickly. Um, one's called the membrane integrity test. These fibers are all tested once a day to make sure that the fibers are upholding. Um, basically, they test them for any leaks. If the leaks exceed a certain amount by the state, if uh, the log reduction value of these fibers gets below a certain point, then the fibers are unable to run. It'll shut off and, and you're not able to run that. So these are tested periodically. You can also, if you have any leaks on certain stacks or any of those units, isolate that entire stack with these valves right here. You can isolate a valve, you can isolate a certain cassette, which is basically one of those larger units. If you have problems with the whole train, you can isolate a train and still run all the rest of them. The other thing I wanted to talk about is backwashes. If you remember in the last video we were talking about backwashing those sand filters and I showed you how that works. Well, you also have backwashes with these membrane fibers. And how that works is pretty much exactly the same as the sand filters do. You reverse the flow. Obviously, if you're pulling water through these fibers and things are collecting on the outside of them, they're going to start to get kind of clogged up on a while. So based on a number of factors, based on the pressure that builds up, from the outside to the inside of the fibers, based on the flow that's leaving the, the, uh, the train, based on a certain amount of time, they, there's a need to backwash these, what they call trains, these individual units. And how they do that is basically by reversing the flow. The flow that leaves the unit is stopped. So this valve right here going down to that pump that valve right there closes. This valve here would open up and this sends clean treated water back. Instead of coming out back the opposite way, it comes in through the top port, it goes down into each of those units, each of those cassettes, 
through the inside of the fibers and out of the fibers into that tank. So it blows that stuff that's built up on those fibers off of the fibers. At the same time, the water that's coming into the train, the, un the unfiltered water, still continues to come in. So you have an excess of water coming in, nothing's leaving, water's coming in through two ports, and it actually overflows this, this train, this compartment here. The water overflows this, and there's these little catch basins you can kind of see one right there, these cassettes sits right in there. So it overflows these catch basins, it overflows the cassette. Under this yellow grid is actually a channel underneath and it carries that water out along that channel into a larger channel and out to waste. Check it out, right as I was talking about it, a back pulse actually just started happening on this exact unit. How awesome is that? So that one valve opened up, sent water reversed. It's coming through the fibers in the reverse area and it's overflowing into that channel. You can see the channel right there. The water's overflowing into it. They're being carried out into this main trough right here. I don't even know if you can see through there, but the water's being carried out into that trough and on and out. Nice, nice filming, Ty, filming the lid. So that's a back pulse, or they call it a back pulse here. Most places call it a back wash. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna make the rest of this part pretty quick. The water comes out of those individual filter cells, let's call them. It comes down through here, collects in this permeate pipe. At this part of the juncture, a post-hypo or chlorine dose is added to the water. Once that chlorine dose is added to the water, the water comes out of the plant and heads into two clear wells for contact time. If you want to do a little bit more about the chlorine dose, I covered that pretty good in the direct filtration video. Also, we talk about that a lot in the podcast. Again, the podcast are the audio files or audio recordings at water, W-A-T-E-R-S-I-F-U-C-F-U.com. Now, I want to talk about one last thing real quick, and I got to do this in under a minute because I'm running out of time here. Um, where does that water go when it's back pulsed or flushed out? This is the interesting and cool thing. The water that's back pulsed comes into a collection tank right here, and it collects the water that's back pulsed through a huge funnel uh, pipe in the bottom. Also, water comes in at that portion over there. They skim the top of their drying beds here. Remember we talked about that D-sludge in the beginning that we showed you. The D-sludges go into these large drying beds and the very top of that gets skimmed off, goes into that wet well, and they're able to reuse 10% of their water if the turbidity is low, send it right around to the front of the plant, to the very beginning of the plant, and retreat it so you have very, very little waste. So that's kind of this plant in a nutshell. The water heads to these, these uh, holding tanks to allow contact time, and then from there, it's sent out to the system. So, I hope you enjoyed that. Once again, that was an overview of a 40 million gallon ultrafiltration membrane plant using submersible membranes, using DAF pretreatment, using lime and carbon dioxide to adjust the pH and alkalinity of the water. And uh, there's the membrane building again. And sent out to the holding tanks. If you enjoyed that, go ahead and check out some of my other videos that I have on YouTube. I have that one on direct conventional filtration. You really should watch that one to go along with this. And if you enjoy the videos, check out the podcast. I have an audio podcast that's available in iTunes or you can listen to it directly at the website, download them completely for free and take them with you where we talk about the water industry. That website is water, W-A-T-E-R-S-I-F-U, waterseafood.com. I only got about a minute left on this recording, so that's why I've been kind of pushed at the end. So I'm gonna cut it short and take off. It's Super Bowl Sunday and I'm sitting here recording this thing on Super Bowl Sunday. What am I doing here? My Niners are in the Super Bowl for like the first time in 18 years. First time since Skippy was a pup, and Skippy's dead now, as they say. So uh, 
onwards here. I hope they win. I'm going to feel really stupid for bringing that up. Go Niners. And I will catch you guys later.